My friends, Ukraine has been ramping up its attacks against Crimea, this peninsula that Russia annexed in 2014. And Ukraine is determined to get it back. We're talking about strikes on important airfields, air defense positions and military bases. But more importantly, we can see an increasing amount of attacks on the Russian Navy's jewel, the Black Sea Fleet, which is the key to full control over Crimea. In a way, the Russian naval base of Sebastopol is increasingly starting to feel besieged as the Ukrainian Navy continues to establish an anti-area access denial zone around Crimea. In order to cripple Russian military assets on the peninsula, Ukrainians combine aerial drones like the Mugen 5 Pro, unmanned surface vehicles like the Magura V-5, storm shadow cruise missile strikes, amphibious raids and soon F-16s as well. If properly coordinated, these attacks would isolate the Crimean Peninsula and transform the Russian Black Sea Fleet into the ghost of Tsushima. <laughs> Meanwhile, according to the latest news, on the 13th of September, five Ukrainian Su-24M bombers fired 10 Storm Shadow cruise missiles at the Russian naval base of Sebastopol. Five were intercepted by the Panzer S-1 air defense system, one by an S-400 unit, and the seventh missile was destroyed by a MiG-31 fighter. However, it wasn't enough because three missiles still went through and damaged the landing ship Minsk, as well as the submarine Rostov on Don, both of which were being repaired in dry docks. As you can see in this picture, the Minsk suffered heavy damage and will most likely be a complete write-off. And the following morning, on September 14th, Ukraine launched 11 aerial drones, which were quickly followed by an Air 360 Neptune anti-ship missile, which destroyed a Russian S-300 air defense missile launcher. And this comes only days after another bold Ukrainian raid. Ukrainian HUR operatives managed to take over control some gas and oil drilling platforms called the Boyko Towers, located 60 kilometers east of Snake Island. This is another step to fully deprive Russia of the ability to fully control the waters of the Black Sea, and a stepping stone towards further attacks directly on Crimea. As you can see on this map, all these Ukrainian attacks aimed at Crimea have Odessa and its surroundings as the starting position. Without this coastline, such raids would not be possible. As you can imagine, for military reasons, Odessa is of strategic importance for Ukraine. However, that's not all. It's currently the biggest and only deep water port in Ukraine, but it plays a pivotal role in Ukraine's access to the global economy. 65% of the country's imports and exports are made through the port of Odessa. However, the situation is tense. Russia withdrew from the grain deal on July 17, 2023, which allowed Ukraine to export grain worldwide via the Black Sea. And we got an answer as to why the Russians did so on September 4th, when Russian Minister of Defense Shoigu claimed that grain corridors were used for the launch of maritime drones by the Ukrainian Navy against Russian assets. And this was a direct violation of the grain deal. Lastly, from a historic perspective, Russia considers Odessa to be theirs by right, as it was founded by Russian Empress Catherine the Great in 1794. Meanwhile, there are more and more hints pointing towards Russian preparations of something against Odessa, perhaps as early as spring 2024, in order to prevent the Ukrainian armed forces from having access to the Black Sea. And looking through Telegram, there's the first whispers of such operations being planned by Russia. However, what Russia doesn't want to tell you is that perhaps the most important reason they want the city of Odessa is because of its nine McDonald's located in the city. And Russian generals terribly crave some Big Macs. For legal purposes, this is a joke. But rest assured, Ukraine is prepared. Already in spring 2022, Ukrainian authorities placed minefields on the beaches of Odessa, and the city was fortified in order to repel a Russian amphibious assault. Increasing the defensive capabilities of Odessa is great, but as you know, the best defense is offense. So to get a full picture of Ukrainian capabilities, we have to trace back all the Ukrainian attacks against Crimea throughout the summer of 2023. Let's start on the 24th of May. 
with this famous footage where Russian intelligence ship Ivan Horus fired its deck mounted 14.5mm machine guns at approaching surface kamikaze drones, which are officially called unmanned surface vehicles or USVs. More troubling, the attack took place 80 nautical miles north of the Bosphorus. As usual, Russia claimed to have destroyed all three incoming targets. Yet this other footage clearly shows one of the surface drones reaching the hull of the vessel. Yet the video feed cuts right before impact. So we can believe it detonated at very close proximity to the ship. The continuous targeting of Russian warships was to be expected. Remember the sinking of the Moskva cruiser on April 13th, 2022. When a couple of UAVs acted as decoys to open the path for Neptune cruise missiles to upgrade the cruiser into a submarine. And six months later, on the 29th of October 2022, we got the first video evidence of the use of Ukrainian surface drones, which damaged the frigate Admiral Makarov right in the harbor of Sebastopol. In other words, Ukraine is waging pure naval guerrilla warfare in the Black Sea. And let's be honest, it's pretty effective. Two weeks later, on the 11th of June, six Ukrainian surface drones launched an attack on the Black Sea fleet Priyazovye, another Russian intelligence gathering ship 300 kilometers from Sebastopol. Here you can see one of them getting destroyed by the warship's AK-630 closing weapon system. Two others were reportedly destroyed as well. Interestingly, both during the attack of the Ivan Horus and the Priyazovye, a US RQ-4 Global Hawk unmanned surveillance aircraft was in the central area of the Black Sea. And both raids took place in close proximity of the Turk Stream gas pipeline linking Russia to Turkey. From all the evidence we can gather with open source data, Ukraine wants to bully Russian warships out of this area, southwest of the Black Sea, in order to... On June 15th, Ukraine switched positions and penetrated Russian airspace from the top, as it launched 11 UAVs against Crimea. Nine were reportedly shot down by Russian air defense, and three were down by electronic warfare assets. However, it's very possible that this raid acted as some sort of rehearsal, because at 5 a.m. on June 22nd, two Ukrainian Storm Shadow missiles struck the Chongar and Sivash bridges connecting Crimea and the Kherson region. As you can see, the bridge was not entirely destroyed, but it certainly hindered Russian logistics. According to the Russian MOD, five out of seven Storm Shadow missiles were destroyed by air defense. Like you can see in this video showing the interception of a Storm Shadow cruise missile by a Panzer S-1 AD system. So, seven shots on target, two goals. Meanwhile, on the 7th of July, Russian Telegram reported a Ukrainian raid on one of the islands of the Dnieper. Those happen on a regular basis and put local Russian forces in a difficult position. One week later, Russia reported the attack of seven unmanned aerial vehicles and two unmanned semi-submersible boats. So we got a combo there. However, we got no trace of the attack which most likely means all unmanned vehicles were intercepted. Yet once again, this seems to have been like some sort of diversion because only a couple hours later, at 3 a.m. on July 17th, Ukrainian naval drones used the Grain Deal Corridor and rushed towards the 12-kilometer-long Kerch Bridge linking Crimea to mainland Russia. One of the sections of the bridge was destroyed as a result of the explosion. This is also the day Russia withdrew in the grain deal. The Russians barely had time to recover that on the following night, Ukraine launched at least 32 aerial drones against Crimea. Five groups of UAVs departed from the Shkolny airfield in Odessa and took off in several directions. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, 17 drones were shot down by the Panzer anti-aircraft missile and gun system, and another 15 by electronic warfare. Ukraine is literally like this guy that DMs every single girl he sees on Instagram, even if 99 of them leave him unseen. If one replies, it's a success. Jokes aside, it would be very interesting to compare electronic warfare assets to more traditional anti-aircraft capabilities against drones. Anyway, July 16th, 
attack. July 17th, attack. 18th, attack. And on July 19th, you know it, another attack. As Ukrainian drones detonated in a Russian ammo depot in the Kerovsky district east of Crimea. We're talking about a four-day raid that included kamikaze aerial and surface drones. In this article from the Wall Street Journal, you can see the size of the explosion, and the fire could be seen from kilometers away. At the same time, these raids can be quite expensive for Ukraine, especially if they can be taken down by electronic warfare as opposed to missiles. Bolstered by their latest success, Ukraine went back on the offensive on the 24th of July. A swarm of kamikaze UAVs were shot down by the air defense systems of the 31st Division of the Russian Armed Forces over Kirovsky, Krasnoperkovsk, and Jankoy, all of which are strategic logistical hubs to get in and out of Crimea. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, 17 aerial drones were destroyed. As you know, an air defense system is not turned on 24-7 and does not cover the entire territory at all times. So a little later, Russian air defense had lowered its guard. This is when a Sukhoi-24 of the Ukrainian Air Force fired four Storm Shadow cruise missiles, three at an ammunition depot in Vilny, 16 kilometers south of Jankoy. Meanwhile, another Storm Shadow missile hit a repair base near Novostepne, which according to this article from Forbes was packed with possibly very important detail, hundreds of vehicles. Forbes wrote, the analysts at the Independent Conflict Intelligence Team noted the absence of secondary explosions in Novostepne, a possible sign there was no chain reaction. AKA, it wasn't an ammunition depot. And we don't really know what the Ukrainians actually destroyed. For we know perhaps they have been fooled and that the military base was empty. At the same time, Russian Telegram was worried because reportedly the Ukrainian Air Force used new routes for its attack in order to fool Russian radars. Now, don't think that the Russians are just standing still. For example, on the night of June 23rd, Russian strategic bombers fired a dozen of cruise missiles against the Khmelnytsky base, where the Sukhoi-24 modified to carry British Storm Shadow cruise missiles operated from. The goal of such aerial counterattacks is to destroy these modified aircraft, of which only a few dozen can still be operated by the Ukrainian Air Force, but mainly the storage areas of these Storm Shadow missiles. The UK and France should each have roughly 700 Storm Shadow and Scalp cruise missiles in storage, so Ukraine can replenish those relatively easily. Same thing one month later on the 27th of July. Business Insider wrote, Russia tried to wipe out a Ukrainian airbase that's crucial to its ability to launch the Storm Shadow missile. To do so, they're using a combination of cruise missiles and Geran-2 kamikaze drones, which damaged a number of Su-24s, on top of these coordinated attacks. Every other day, the Russians launched swarms of Geran-2 against Ukrainian installations in the Odessa region. On August 1st, Ukraine launched an attack 340 kilometers south west of Sebastopol against Russian patrol ships Sergei Kotov and Vasily Bukov with three unmanned surface drones. Turkstream? Coincidence? Since we don't have more details about what happened, we can assume the attack has failed. Once again, the commander of the Black Sea Fleet could breathe, but not for long. During the night of August 3rd to the 4th, more than a dozen aerial drones flew towards the Russian naval port of Feodosia hoping to hit oil tanks and power plants. There were some explosions here and there, but nothing substantial. Allegedly, Ukrainians used 18 modified Mugin 5 Pro drones that can carry 20 to 25 kilograms of explosives each. They cost between $10,000 and $15,000 per unit. So for the cost of one second-hand Leopard 2A6, Ukraine could buy 382 of these Mugin 5 Pro UAVs. And you know what you could do with $15,000 in the Amsterdam Red <laughs> However, this was, once again, a diversion. As Ukraine launched a second attack, a naval one, and managed to hit the assault learning ship Alinigorsky Garniak, the Russian Ministry of Defense said all surface drones were destroyed, as they always do. But as you can see in this video, a Magura V5 carrying 300 kilograms of TNT approached the ship 
during the night and disabled the vessel with 100 Russian sailors on board. I mean, yeah, the surface drone was indeed destroyed. Destroyed upon impact with the ship. I mean, here you can see the aftermath of the attack. There is no debate. Even more impressive for Ukraine. They carried this attack right on the outer perimeter of Russia's Novorossiysk naval base. 700 kilometers away from Odessa. This marks the first ever successful Ukrainian strike within Russia's internationally recognized territorial waters. And cherry on top of the Bunda, this is Russia's second largest naval base in the Black Sea and the largest Russian oil export outlet to the European market. This is also where the Turkstream pipeline goes into the Black Sea. At this point, it becomes clear that for Ukraine, yes, one of the main objectives would be to destroy the Russian Black Sea fleet, but another is to disrupt the Russian economy by targeting this pipeline. No! The bulk of these naval attacks were carried by the Megura, which stands for Maritime Autonomous Guard Unmanned Robotic Apparatus, and is said to have been developed by Ukraine. As you saw in the footage, it can easily be remotely piloted through its waterproof FPV camera. What's crazy is that it has an operational range of 800 kilometers. It can strike almost anywhere in the Black Sea and all of the Russian controlled coastline. As of late 2022, the fundraising campaign by United24 had gathered money for at least 30 such unmanned surface drones. But according to my estimates, Ukraine has less than 10 of this batch left, unless they built more units in the meantime. All these naval drones belong to a new unit of the Ukrainian Navy, the 385th Separate Brigade. As you can see on screen, they have a huge array of USVs, from unmanned jet skis to Maguras to bigger models like the Sea Babies, which can carry payloads up to 860 kilograms, almost three times more than the Magura. It is believed that it's a sea baby that seriously damaged the Kerch Bridge on July 17th. Now imagine the damage it can do to a Russian warship. Anyway, boom, boom, boom. In the night of August 4th to the 5th, another Ukrainian USV struck the Russian oil tanker SIG near the southern entrance of the Kerch Strait. The vessel was contracted by the Russian military to ship fuel. Five days later, on August 10th, 12 Mugen 5 Pro drones were launched from the Odessa region. The attack was again preceded by active reconnaissance in the Black Sea area. In the southwest and south of Crimea, the French Atlantic II base patrol aircraft was operating, as well as three US Air Force MQ-9A Reaper drones. But of course, it's only Russia versus Ukraine, of course! <laughs> One can wonder if Ukrainians could still carry on all these naval attacks without the intelligence gathering aircraft from NATO in the Black Sea. At 11 p.m. on August 17th, Ukraine targeted once again the Russian patrol ship Vasily Bukov. Together with the escort frigate Putlivy, the warships managed to shoot and destroy an incoming Ukrainian surface drone, again in the southwestern part of the Black Sea. But it's really one week later, on the 23rd of August, that Ukraine achieved another feat of arms, the destruction of an S-300 or S-400 battery near the village of Olyanivka on Cape Tarhankut. As you can see on these images, one Russian missile launcher was destroyed for sure, reportedly as well as a fuel station, but the fragments and the explosion possibly damaged another launcher as well, and even the radar station. Just a few scratch would already mean weeks of repairs. First, the Ukrainian Air Force launched two Mugin-5 drones as decoys to draw air defense fire. Immediately after, three Ukrainian missiles were fired from the seaside, presumably a combination of Harpoon and Neptune anti-ship missiles fired from boats. Let me know in the comment sections which boats this could be. What's interesting is that the day before, some Russian fighter jets carried airstrikes on the Ukrainian Navy near Snake Island. Reportedly, three speedboats were sunk, but not all of them. That's according to the Russians. We don't know if any were hit, honestly, but there was increased activity in the sector. Another interesting factor is how did the Ukrainians manage to record the entire thing? Where was Russian air defense? Well, some analysts recalled that a month before the attack, 
There were rumors that the Ukrainians first tested their newly acquired Portuguese-made Dekiver AR-5, an American VBAT unmanned surveillance system. The Dekiver AR-5 is perfect for maritime missions as it can operate over long distances and was made to withstand harsh weather conditions. The Ukrainians now had momentum. They benefited from a local technological advantage and Russian defenses were in shambles. So the next day, they launched four high-speed boats filled with operatives for an amphibious raid against that same Cape Tarhankut between the settlements of Mayak and Olinivka. According to this camera footage, a Crimean security guard in his underwear was able to raise the alarm and pin down the location of these Ukrainian operatives, which helped the incoming Russian rapid response team. After which, the Ukrainian operatives quickly went back on their boats and went home. We were yet in the middle of a day-after-day day Ukrainian offensive. But clearly this one was the boldest attempt yet. And it was not over because on the 25th of August, Ukraine launched 42 Mugin-5 Pro UAVs. Nine were able to fly close to the base of the 126 Coastal Defense Brigade near Pyrvalnoye, where they were jammed by electronic warfare. Several of these UAVs detonated on the territory of the military base, damaging two army trucks. This is why we also have to calculate the cost and effectiveness of these aerial attacks. At the same time, these are cheap and expendable UAVs, meant to be destroyed as decoys. Their main purpose is to allow the Ukrainian Air Force to detect enemy air defense positions. Three days later, on the 28th of August, Russian air defense downed two Portuguese Tekever UAVs at 10.24 and 10.40 a.m. As usual, in typical Ukrainian fashion, those were sent as decoys to detect Russian firing positions. Quickly after, a Neptune anti-ship missile was fired from the Odessa region, but was intercepted just before reaching the peninsula. However, the fact that the armed forces of Ukraine started using Neptune anti-ship missiles for ground targets could indicate a refinement of their attacks, since these anti-ship missiles have the ability to fly right over the surface of the water, which in turn makes them harder to detect. At the same time, it could also mean that the Ukrainians are running low on modified Sukhoi-24s or Storm Shadow missiles. Which could explain why Ukraine is urgently asking for F-16s. On the night of August 30th, a Russian aircraft of the Black Sea Fleet thwarted once again an attempt of the armed forces of Ukraine to land sabotage groups on Cape Tarhankut. According to French newspaper Le Monde, Russia destroyed four speedboats carrying a total of 50 operatives. Here we have some footage of a Sukhoi-27 going after various speedboats which pretty much confirms the Russian perspective of the story. Plus this mission to rescue the crews of the destroyed vessels. In this other video, the situation seems tense, as a US-made speedboat is seen escaping shelling. Just like you would do during a siege, Ukraine wants to capture all of these oil drilling platforms, each of which would be another stepping stone to conquer another one. Ukrainian forces would then be able to place mobile radars and various communications equipment on these abandoned platforms. I'm sure script writers at Call of Duty are like, write this down, write this down now! Lastly, on September 2nd, we restart the cycle with another three unmanned naval drones towards the Crimean Bridge. The first one was destroyed at 23.15, the second one at 2.10 a.m. and the third at 2.20 a.m. In response to these attacks, the Russians brought seven flooded barges and positioned them right in front of the Crimean Bridge. Apparently, there are cables and chains attached between each of these barges. It could be a very interesting, low-tech response to this threat. And like I brought up in the intro, on September 11th, Ukrainian operatives captured some more oil rigs, which will be very important for the logistics of future raids on the Crimean Peninsula. Which brings us to the events of the 13th and 14th of September, where we can witness yet another round of Ukrainian strikes. After the usual NATO recon missions over the Black Sea, Ukrainians used the same tactics that worked for them in the past few weeks, but this time simply increased the number of attacking units. For example, it's the first time we see five Su-24 bombers attack at the same time. Same goes for the USVs that now attack in groups of six. This is why, despite constant counterattacks in the form of Geran-2 and cruise missile strikes, 
The Russian high command understands that the only way to stop attacks on Crimea is to occupy all the Ukrainian ports along the Black Sea coast and deprive them of coastal infrastructure. Similar to what Chile achieved against Bolivia and Peru during the War of the Pacific of 1879 to 1883, where Chilean gains along the Pacific coast turned Bolivia into a landlocked nation. And this war still has an impact today. However, such Russian operation against Odessa is almost like Mission Impossible. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.